Here's a summary of the entire physics paper one spec. Energy is measured in joules and it's always conserved. So this basically means that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transferred from one store to another. There are eight different types of these energy stores. Thermal energy stores, where the hotter an object is, the more energy it has in its thermal energy store. Chemical energy stores, which is energy that's released during a chemical reaction. Examples of these are food, batteries and fuels. Next is kinetic energy store, which any moving object has. The faster the object, the more it has. Gravitational potential energy stores, which is energy stored due to an object's height in a gravitational field. The higher the object, the more energy it has in its gravitational potential energy stores. Next up, we have elastic potential energy stores, which is energy stored whenever an object is stretched or squashed. Nuclear energy stores involve energy that's released during nuclear reactions. Magnetic energy stores, which are due to the attraction or repulsion between magnets. And finally, electrostatic energy stores. These are due to the attraction or repulsion between charged particles, things such as electrons and protons. Now, energy always exists in one of these eight stores, but it doesn't just stay there. Energy can be transferred between these stores in four different ways. The first is mechanically, where a force is applied on an object. So for example, when a person throws a ball, energy is transferred mechanically from the chemical energy stores of the person, from the food that they eat, to the kinetic energy stores of the ball. The second is by heating, which is where energy is transferred from a hot object to a colder one. So for example, when a kettle heats water, energy is transferred from the thermal energy stores of the kettle's heating element to the thermal energy store of the water. The third type is by electric work, which is when current flows in a circuit and transfers energy. So like an electric fan transferring energy from its chemical energy stores in the battery to the kinetic energy stores of the fan blades. And finally, we have energy transfer by radiation, where energy is transferred in the form of a wave, just like how the sun transfers thermal energy to the earth. Kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy and elastic potential energy can all be calculated using equations. Next, we have specific heat capacity, which is defined as the amount of energy required to increase the temperature of one kilogram of an object by one degree Celsius. The equation for this is energy is equal to mass times specific heat capacity times change in temperature. Power is next and is defined as the rate at which energy is transferred. This is measured in watts. Energy transferred is the same as work done, so the two equations for power can both be written as power is equal to energy transferred over time and power is equal to work done over time. Next, let's talk about efficiency. When an energy transfer takes place in an object, some of the energy is usefully transferred and some is wasted or dissipated. Efficiency is defined as the useful energy given out by an object over the total energy put into the object. And you can also write it in terms of power as useful power output over total power input. Let's move on to energy resources, which is all about ways that we generate electricity. We have non-renewable energy resources, which are the ones that will eventually run out and cannot be reused, and renewable ones that can be reused. In non-renewable resources, we have fossil fuels, which include coal, oil and gas. They are made out of remains of living organisms that died millions of years ago. They produce a lot of energy, but they also produce carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas, which can lead to global warming. The other non-renewable resource is nuclear energy, which releases energy from nuclear reactions. It also produces a lot of energy and no carbon dioxide, but it does produce nuclear waste, which is expensive to dispose of. For renewable resources, most don't produce carbon dioxide and will not run out, but they have their disadvantages. Wind, which uses wind turbines, is unreliable as it's dependent on the speed of the wind. And similarly, solar energy uses solar panels and that's dependent on the sun being out, so it won't generate electricity in the nighttime, for example. Wave power also uses turbines to produce electricity, but it doesn't produce as much electricity as the others and could be dangerous to marine life. Tidal barrages use turbines that use the energy from tides going up and down. This can also kill marine life and you need a suitable location to construct these. Hydroelectric energy involves building a dam in a valley and using turbines in the dam to generate electricity. But these can only be built in limited location and they can disrupt the ecosystem by damaging animal habitats. Geothermal uses the thermal energy underground in volcanic areas to create steam that turns turbines, but these can only be used in volcanic areas. And finally, we have biofuels which are made from plants and waste and are burnt. These release carbon dioxide, but they're still carbon neutral as the carbon dioxide released from burning them was originally taken in by the plant during its lifetime. The next topic is all about electricity and here are every single circuit symbol that you need to know. 
The first is for a cell which is used to provide a potential difference to the circuit which is needed for a current to flow. Next we have a battery which is just a combination of cells and has the same function. A switch is used to break and complete a circuit. So when it's open, current can't flow through it, but when it's closed, the circuit is complete and current can flow. Next up, we have a filament lamp, which is just a bulb that lights up when current flows through it. We also have ammeters, which are devices which measure the current in a circuit and need to always be connected in series. This just means they need to be connected in the same loop as all the other components. Voltmeters, on the other hand, measure potential difference and need to be connected in parallel. This just means they need to be connected in a separate loop. Next, we have a resistor, which is a component that opposes the flow of current in a circuit by adding resistance to it. Variable resistors are similar, but they allow you to control how much resistance is added to a circuit. You can use them like a dimmer switch and you can control how much current flows by increasing and decreasing its resistance. Thermistors are temperature dependent resistors that change the resistance in a circuit based on the temperature of the surroundings. So if it's a hot day, the resistance of the thermistor will be low and on a cold day, it will be high. Similarly, we have light dependent resistors that work the same but depend on the light intensity of the surroundings. So if it's in a bright room, the resistance will be low and in a dark room, it will be very high. Diodes are devices that only allow current to flow in one direction. If the diode is connected in the wrong direction, they have a very high resistance which prevent current from flowing. Next, we have LEDs which stand for light emitting diodes. These also only allow current to flow in one direction and when current does flow in the correct direction, the LED gives off light. And finally, we have a fuse which is a safety device with a tiny wire in it. And if too much current flows through it, the wire will melt and break the circuit. This prevents people from getting electrocuted when there's faults in a device. Current is defined as the flow of electrical charge and is measured in amps. Potential difference is the energy per unit charge and it's measured in volts. It's basically the force that pushes the current around the circuit. And resistance is a property that reduces the flow of current and this is measured in ohms. There are two equations that are related to these definitions and these are Q equals IT and V equals IR. IV graph shows how current through a component changes with the potential difference applied to it and you can carry out a practical to see what an IV graph of a particular component looks like. The components being tested in this practical are resistors, filament lamps and diodes and to test any of these you need to first build a test circuit. This includes a battery as a power source, an ammeter connected in series to measure current and a voltmeter connected in parallel to measure the potential difference. You also need a variable resistor to change the current flowing through the circuit. So now you place the component being tested in and note down the ammeter and voltmeter readings. Next, you alter the current and repeat the readings and you keep doing this for several different currents. Once you've done that, swap the connections to the battery to reverse the current's direction and repeat the process. This checks the component's behavior in both directions. You're now ready to plot a graph of current against potential difference. If a resistor is connected, you get a linear graph as there's a straight line through the origin. This means that current and potential difference are directly proportional. If a filament lamp or a diode was connected, you would get these shapes. And this shows that they're both non-linear components as they're not straight lines. Other graphs include the one for light dependent resistors where their resistance decreases as the light intensity of the surroundings increase. Similarly, we have thermistors, but these decrease their resistance when temperature of the surroundings increase. Resistance is something that reduces the current in a circuit and you can use a practical to investigate it. This practical involves two experiments. The first investigates how the length of a wire affects resistance. For this, you'll need to set up a circuit with a battery and an ammeter connected in series. You also need a voltmeter connected in parallel to crocodile clips, which are attached to the wire you're investigating. You'll need to use a ruler to measure the length of the wire. First start off by placing one crocodile clip on the 0cm mark of the ruler, then connect a second one on the 5cm mark to test the resistance of 5cm of wire. Then you can note down the ammeter and voltmeter readings to give you the current and potential difference. The next step is to move the crocodile clip to a new length such as 10cm and then repeat the process. Keep repeating this process for several different lengths and you'll have multiple current and potential difference readings for different lengths of wire. You can now work out the resistance by using the equation V equals IR. Just rearrange it to give you resistance is equal to potential difference over current. So that means dividing each voltmeter reading by the ammeter reading. And this will give you the resistance which you can plot in a graph. Then draw a line of best fit and this will tell you that as the length of the wire increases, its resistance also increases. 
The second experiment investigates how a combination of resistors affects the total resistance in a circuit, both in a series and parallel circuit. To investigate how resistors in series and in parallel affect the overall resistance, you can set up the following three circuits. The first tests the resistance of a single resistor, the second tests two resistors connected in series, and the third tests two resistors connected in parallel. Just like in the first circuit, take a note down of the ammeter and voltmeter readings for each setup you're investigating, and use the same equation to find the resistance in each circuit. As an example, let's say we had resistors with resistance of 7 and 8 ohms. For the first example, if you connected one of the resistors and got a voltmeter reading of 140 volts and an ammeter reading of 20 amps, you can divide the two values to give you 7 ohms, which tells you that the 7 ohm resistor is connected. Now if you connected the 7 and 8 ohm resistor in series and did the same thing, you would find that the total resistance of the combination would be the sum of the two individual resistors. So that would be 7 plus 8 which gives you a total of 15 ohms. But something else would happen if you connected them in parallel. Here you would find that the total resistance would be lower than the lowest value of the smallest resistance. So that would mean you'd get a resistance lower than 7 ohms as a total resistance in the circuit. To improve the accuracy of any three of these experiments, make sure that the circuit is disconnected between any readings you take. This is because the wire would warm up when the circuit is on and affect the resistance readings. By switching it off, you allow the wire to cool down so it doesn't affect the readings. Circuits can be one of two types. Series circuits where all the components are on one loop and parallel circuits when they're on different loops. In series circuits, current is the same everywhere and the potential difference is shared between the components, whereas in parallel circuits, potential difference is the same on each branch and current splits at each branch. Resistance increases as you add more resistors in series, but it decreases when you add them in parallel. For domestic electricity, you need to know the differences between direct current, which flows in one direction, and alternating current, which always changes in direction. Alternating current is used in the UK main supply which is 230 volts and 50 hertz. The plugs used in mains electricity contain a 3 core cable made up of a brown live wire which carries 230 volts, a blue neutral wire which completes the circuit and a green and yellow earth wire which is for safety. The earth wire is just used when you have a fault where the live wire comes in contact with the metal casing of an appliance. Power is the rate at which energy is transferred and electrical power can be found using these three equations. The final part of this topic is all about the national grid where electricity leaves the power station and passes through a step up transformer where its potential difference is increased so that less energy is lost due to heat in the cables. It is then distributed around the country and goes through a step down transformer for safety before reaching your home. Here's an equation for transformers that helps you work out the current and potential difference going in and out of a transformer. The third topic starts with density where the equation is mass over volume and you can find the volume of an object by using a eureka can and measuring the water displaced by it. You can then divide mass by that volume and you can find the density of the object. You also need to know how density changes in solids, liquids and gases and how the particles are arranged in each one. Solids have close particles with a regular structure, liquids also have close particles but the structure is irregular, and gases are particles which are far apart that move quickly in random directions. In a gas the particles collide with each other and the walls of the container. This creates a pressure on the container and as temperature increases the speed of the particles increase and this can cause the gas particles to hit the walls of the container more often and with a greater force which creates more pressure. Next we have changes in states where going from a solid to liquid is known as melting and the reverse process is called freezing. Then going from liquid to gas is known as boiling and the reverse process of that is known as condensing. This is all to do with the changes in internal energy where internal energy is the sum of the kinetic and potential energies of particles in a system. The internal energy of a system increases as it's heated and so when it goes from a solid to a liquid to a gas it also increases. The energy required to change the state of an object is known as the latent heat and specific latent heat is defined as the amount of energy required to change the state of one kilogram of a substance with no change in temperature. You can have latent heat of fusion which is for when a solid turns into a liquid and latent heat of vaporization when a liquid turns into a gas. When these state changes are happening the temperature of the substance stays the same and this is shown in the heating and cooling graphs. These have flat bits because when you're changing the state of the object the temperature doesn't change. 
The energy supplied to it is used to break the bonds of the substance rather than increasing the temperature of the substance. Topic 4 is an atomic structure. The model of what we think an atom is has changed a lot throughout history. John Dalton said that atoms were spheres where each element had a specific type of atom. JJ Thompson then discovered the electron and came up with a plum pudding model where electrons were embedded within a positive sphere. Ernst Rutherford then discovered the nucleus by carrying out the alpha particle scattering experiment where he found that alpha particles mostly passed straight through a piece of gold foil while a few were deflected. Then Niels Bohr discovered the proton and said that electrons orbited the nucleus at fixed distances known as shells. And finally James Chadwick then discovered the neutron which led to the structure of the atom that we use today. In this structure we have an atom made up of protons, neutrons and electrons and these are the masses and charges of them. Protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus of an atom and the electrons orbit the nucleus in shells or energy levels. These electrons can go up energy levels by absorbing electromagnetic radiation and they can also go down by emitting electromagnetic radiation. Nuclear symbols for elements can show you the mass number which gives you the number of protons and neutrons and the atomic number which can give you the number of protons. Isotopes are atoms of an element with the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons. Some isotopes are stable but others are unstable and they become stable by giving off radiation. This is known as radioactive decay and it's a random process. Radioactive decay is measured using a Geiger Muller tube and it's measured in Becquerels. There are three types of radiation that you can have. Alpha which is a helium nucleus, beta which is an electron and gamma which is an electromagnetic wave. Alpha has a high ionizing power which means it can remove electrons from an atom easily but it has a low penetrating power which means it can't pass through many materials. It's stopped by paper, skin and a few centimetres of air. Beta has a moderate ionising and penetrating power and can be stopped by aluminium. Gamma on the other hand has the lowest ionising power but has the highest penetrating power and is only stopped by thick lead or concrete. The half-life of a material is the time it takes for the number of undecayed nuclei to half. In a graph you can find the half-life by drawing a line at half of the initial activity. You draw this up to the curve and then you extend it downwards and read what the time says. And finally we have contamination and irradiation which are two different ways that object can be exposed to ionizing radiation. Contamination is when a radioactive particle comes into direct contact with a material or object whereas irradiation is when an object is just exposed to the radiation given off by the radioactive particles. Alpha radiation poses the greatest contamination risk because it's the most ionizing but the least irradiation risk. This is because it can't travel far in air. Whereas gamma poses the greatest irradiation risk and the lowest contamination risk.